for more, we're joined by U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, who's at the COP28 summit in Dubai. Secretary Kerry, thank you so much for talking to us. Now, the first big question at this year's COP28 talks is whether to prioritise a phase out or a phase down for fossil fuel use. Is a deal phasing out fossil fuel use still a realistic goal at this point? Now, we heard earlier in the report that it's especially challenging for developing nations, and you've been encouraging a phase-out of unabated fossil fuels as a viable option. Uh, how has progress been so far on that front? Well, the discussion is taking place, <clears throat> obviously. Uh, it's a critical, critical issue because uh, while the world is trying to reduce emissions from fossil fuel plants, uh, some people are still building those plants in ways that don't capture the emissions. So there's a sense of insanity or absurdity in, in everybody around the world working to put out renewable energy, put out clean energy, nuclear, whatever it is. And meanwhile, some people are choosing the old fashioned and dirty, actually life taking, uh, you know, it, it, it's a technology that actually kills people around the world. Eight million people a year are dying because of the quality of air. And that quality of air is coming principally from coal emissions. So it is absolutely critical that we contain that. We will find, I am confident, a compromise uh, that, that moves us in the right direction here. And I think that's what's critical. When you have 195 countries coming to the negotiation, it's hard. But we will, I think, find a landing spot where everybody can agree it's going to move us forward and accelerate the transition to the clean energy economy. We have to do that because the threats to the planet, to all of us, for food production, for water, for air quality, for our ability to be able to uh, uh, guarantee that the next generation is going to be able to have forests that are still there and, and glaciers and so forth. All of these things are dependent on the decisions we make here and now. So I'm confident we'll find a way forward. We have uh, historically. Uh, and I think uh, hopefully people come here in good faith in an effort to do that. Mm, well, uh, despite that uh, coming together, there are some differing opinions. Uh, most notably, the COP28 president, Sultan al Jaba, has said that there is no science behind demands for the phase out of fossil fuels. And that also phasing out of coal, oil and gas would take the world back into caves. Uh, how would you address what he calls the misrepresentation and misinterpretation of climate science? Well, I think he's been very clear. He, he, he clarified that yesterday and made it clear what he meant. Uh, what, what I think all of us who work on this climate issue know is that the, uh, that the truth is that the science is focused on the emissions. And the science has said that we have to reduce 43% of those emissions by 2030 and then get to net zero by 2050. Uh, Dr. Sultan al Jaber, myself, everybody here, have all embraced the notion that we must live up to the promise of holding the Earth's temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. That's what we're all committed on. That's what we're working on. And, and there will be, of course, with 195 countries, different opinions, different thoughts about the pace, which technology first. Uh, and what we've tried to do is allow countries to make their own choices, obviously. We can. What we can do is put on the table the best choices, the options that will get the job done and grow people's economies, have clean energy uh, and move to this future that is really going to be cleaner and healthier and safer than where we are today. Mm. And speaking of getting the job done, uh, Sultan al Jaba also responded to the criticism saying, uh, stop the pointing of fingers, show me the solutions. So what would it take to convince those in fossil fuel dependent countries uh, that phasing them out will ultimately still be beneficial for them in the long run? What would some of those solutions look like? Well, let me answer that question by saying to you, there are oil and gas companies in the world, uh, a number of them, who have decided they're not going to be an oil and gas company, they're going to be an energy company. And they're going to produce energy that is clean and that moves to this new future. Now, if you can reduce all your emissions and you happen to be in fossil fuel, then obviously you can meet the test of what is necessary to continue forward, which is not making the emissions or capturing the emissions. 
Those are the two alternatives. You either capture them or you don't make them. But we cannot continue to have massive amount of killer greenhouse gas being put up in the atmosphere, taking the lives of people, and, 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 and creating enormous challenges to all of us uh, for the long-term future of this planet. It was 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Arctic last summer. It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Antarctic. What does it take for people to understand when you see the floods and the fires and the mudslides and the incredible intensity of storms, the number of billion-dollar climate events happening all around the world? I mean, what does it take for people to be able to realize you can to make a better choice? We human beings have the privilege of being the only species on the planet that are allowed to think and be rational and make these choices. So let's be rational and let's get the job done by transitioning, transitioning, not tomorrow, not in a year. It's going to take a period of time. Mm -hmm. But we've got to move in the right direction in order to get this done. And everybody all around the world will live better, have, have uh, uh, an opportunity to pass the world on to their kids and their grandchildren in better, but we're a far measure from that right now. Mm, Secretary Kerry, it looks like carbon capture might have a role to play here, you, as you mentioned. Uh, but the IEA has also denounced the use of the technology, calling it an illusion when it comes to tackling climate change. Also, many countries have come together to voice serious concerns that there is a danger of it being used to greenlight fossil fuel expansion. How can we ensure the use of this technology won't backfire when it comes yeah. to achieving these global climate goals? Well, both of the things you just described are absolutely accurate. It potentially could be a waste, but we don't know the answer to that yet. But the leader of the IEA that you just quoted would tell you also that we cannot get to net zero 2050 without some capture. We just can't get there. We also can't get to net zero 2050, which the science says we have to do, without some nuclear. So there are certain things we have to do in this transitional process that may not be the choices going forward for the long term. If we have fusion suddenly coming on board or battery storage, which is much longer period of time than today, or other kinds of storage or hydrogen, uh, once that price comes down, there are a lot of alternatives that are being cooked up in various places. And, and, and there are a lot of companies around the world making good money and providing good jobs to people that are pursuing this clean energy economy. We need more people to embrace it, not fight it. We need more people to say, yes, we have to transition because we know what the downsides and dangers are right now. Listen to the science. Everything we are doing is a result of science, not politics, not ideology, not some wild scheme. It comes from what the scientists, the best scientists in the world are saying to us. And we need to heed those warnings and get this job done. And in doing it, in, in the United States right now, more jobs are being created in the, in the renewable sector than in fossil fuel. It is the future, and we need to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. If carbon capture works, and it's affordable, and you can get the permitting, and you can put it in place, that's going to be one of the tools. But we, we need to move faster and stop this debate that, that is somehow confronting people who have a different way of doing it, but who want to do something against those who actually are denying it and don't want to do anything. we got to stop and go forward. Mm. And speaking of going forward, another important aspect to focus on is also the efforts to reduce methane emissions. We have 50 oil companies representing nearly half the global production pledging to reach near zero methane emissions by 2030. And the Biden administration also unveiled some final rules to crack down on the releases of methane by US oil and gas industry. Well, the UN Secretary right. General Antonio Guterres has called these efforts a step in the right direction. But he also says that there is still no clear pathway to reaching net zero by 2050. Environment groups have also called it a smokescreen for the actual phasing out of fossil fuels. What's your response to this? Well, my response, I already gave it to you to some degree, that the marketplace is going to produce all kinds of choices here. And people obviously are going to be affected by what's the price of what it is. Uh, they're not going to pay a massive premium 
for uh, something that they don't know and don't trust at the point. I, I believe that uh, uh, it is very clear that we can move forward using these various technologies to some degree, while other new technologies are going to come online. But we're not going to get this job done if we're sort of pointing the finger at one or the other. Uh, uh, the methane is critical to reaching 2050. We put forward the methane pledge. We have 155 countries that are all committed to getting a 30% reduction in methane by 2030, and then going on from there to have a complete zero uh, methane uh, by 2050. Now, why is that important? Because methane is a greenhouse gas, goes up in the atmosphere, and, and, and in its raw form, it is 80 to 100 times more destructive than CO2. And methane is responsible for half the warming of the planet. And frankly, methane right now is getting about 1% or 2% of all the funding of climate to try to deal with it. It wasn't really talked about in Paris. Uh, now it is, because we understand how dangerous it is. I think we should welcome all those people willing to come to the table to reduce the damages that are coming from methane. <laughs> Mm. Well, when an another breakthrough that's happened on day one of uh, COP28 also is an agreement on the loss and damage fund uh, to compensate less developed nations for the effects of climate change. Uh, what's your assessment of the fund's effectiveness so far? Uh, what more needs to be done to make sure that the resources are distributed more efficiently to those who actually need it most? Well, we worked very, very hard uh, all through the summer uh, and we supported the creation of a fund. Uh, and now we have this new fund, which is the uh, Climate Impacts Response Fund. And that Climate Impact Response Fund uh, is going to help us be able to deal with those countries most affected. I mean, the terrible thing about what's happening in the planet today is that most of the emissions come from the developed world, and they're having, a, obviously, a great impact on more vulnerable countries in other parts of the world. So we have to come together to, to, to address this. And I think that uh, uh, this uh, effort we've made here is quite remarkable because not only did we, did we create it in name in, in the sense that we, we, we said there will be a fund in Sharm El Sheikh. Here on the very first day, on the together, Said yes to this proposal, which creates this climate act response fund. People here get something, and, and not to waste of young people around the world now that are waiting for us to get the job done properly. Mm. Now, uh, Secretary Kerry, let's talk a little bit about climate cooperation between the two giants in the room, the U.S. and China. Uh, the Sunnylands statement that released in November uh, aligns both countries on many aspects of climate policy, including more transparent and ambitious national targets, also limiting methane and nitrous oxide emissions, etc. How will the U.S. and China build on these points of common interest and then translate them into more concrete and more ambitious action at COP28? Well, at Sunnylands, we really had a, a, a great step forward because China and the United States agreed that all greenhouse gases will be made part of everybody's national uh, plan for reduction of emissions. So that's good. We also agreed uh, for the first time that we're going to be able to deploy increased amount of renewables. And we're doing it specifically to permit us to be able to reduce emissions earlier than what's gonna happen. So that's a step forward. We also agreed that we both wanna to work together to be able to help make COP20 guarantee that we're gonna be a force for, for, uh, for getting an agreement and for making this agreement move this process forward in a thoughtful way. And finally, we agreed we're gonna have a working group and we're gonna to continue to work on this. And yesterday you know, and other days, we've met and talked with different people here in the, in, at the COP, all of whom agree that we need to focus on methane. And now China is prepared to work with us to try to do that. They put out a national methane plan. It's a step forward.
and we will continue to work well after this COP. And we definitely look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you so much for your time, Secretary Kerry. I've been speaking with the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, Great at the COP28 talks you. in Dubai.